Week one of playoffs was already jammed, packed with upsets, silver scrapes, and surprise picks. We'll see what 100 Thieves and Evil Geniuses can deliver with their best of five today. Now, yesterday, TSM delivered on what fans of the org wanted, a swift 3-0 after the disappointing start to the postseason. Albeit, uh, maybe not the prettiest 3-0 we've ever seen. No, I think yeah. this was... Oh, go oh, ahead. God. Mark, Sorry, you were talking, you go. Mark did, wait, no, hold on, Mark. Did you tweet that we're live yet? I didn't tweet we're live yet, but come yeah, on. Okay, never mind. All right, Mark doesn't no, get to talk up, anymore. It's, go it's, tweet, it's my turn. All right. take it. So, yeah, TSM, they're definitely not at the level that they need to be at. They weren't really tested that much yesterday against Dignitas. They pretty much were winning all solo lanes, but they weren't able to stack dragons as fast as the other top teams. And their mid-game macro still isn't as clean, so I definitely would like to see them step up in their next series. I do like the fact that they finally, I think, figured out a bit of their meta where they're giving treats the second pick and support but the problem still is I think they don't know the bot lane meta they still did the blind pick Caitlyn Morgana and they got hard punished in their last match and this isn't against you know the strongest bot lane in the league either so the fact that they just don't know what to pick and they're just kind of copying Golden Guardians draft kind of gets me worried for them. I was going to say, I think there's also going to be some reservations probably around the fact that no one fully copied the Golden Guardians blueprint just yet, right? In throwing all of the bands at Bjergsen. And so maybe there was some fe flexibility afforded to TSM just by virtue uh, of not being targeted so directly from the side of Bjergsen. So I'll be curious, you know, if they end up in that rematch of, against Golden Guardians, do they have a specific plan to, to take, uh, you know, to take a series against a, a team they already dropped 3-0 they might. I mean, I hope they come up. I mean, you saw Bjergsen's interview where he was talking about, ah, oh, these bands don't really affect me, but it is still a very nice advantage that TSM has, the fact that, you know, you can kind of guess the enemy opponent is just going to throw these bands away, so it gives them a lot more, like, fluidity in the draft. They can kind of pick different things, but... Yeah, to me, it's just I got to see more from the TSM bot lane, and that's really what I'm looking for in the future. I, I think tweeted, the James, am I allowed to talk now? You tweeted? All right, fine, Mark. If you tweet it, I'll Welcome go back. retweet while you talk. Ready, go. Okay, so I, I agree with probably about the whole not getting tested by the bot lane. I think TSM still stepped up and showed that some of the concern was overblown. Like, yeah, they struggled versus Golden Guardians. Maybe there's some draft things that they need to still iron out. But at the very least, they are a step up against some of these other teams that were starting in the lower bracket, and they have time to improve now. I agree, not being totally blown away by their answers to the Kate uh, and Morgana problems. Just take it away and then lose lane still. I still want to see more, but they at least showed the set in Italy was working. They showed yeah. some of those other things can still go in their favor. Spika had a pop-off game. Broken Blade had a great game. Every game, someone else was the primary carry. Bjergsen in game one as well so that was still uh good to see like seeing that uh that speak a pop off that's going to put something on the minds of golden guardians or team liquid if they end up having to face uh tsm of course you know uh, uh, another you know maybe you know positive note or bright side of all of this is that tsm now does buy themselves a full week to have some of that prep uh towards their next series uh but as tsm moves on to the next round that was an elimination our first elimination best of five our second one coming today so it's the end of the road for dignitas uh let's say our farewells but i, I want to call out uh you know john specifically uh, as somebody that we were looking at at the end of the split as being a, a, a performer, someone who has stepped up uh, all throughout the summer split. Yeah, uh, he, he definitely uh, stepped up quite a bit and was... Uh, so I think the bright spot for Dignitas fans throughout the course of the season, uh, someone that they can build around going forward. Afro as well stepped up quite a bit and could become a, a good bot lane. Uh, I don't know if people exactly want to see them built around again, but they did look a lot better by the end of the split. And then Dardock as well, uh, he, he was super incredible. So I think there's enough pieces for them to play with going forward. It's just a shame that it didn't quite work out this, this split. All right, well, today we close out the week with 100 Thieves versus Evil Geniuses playing for their playoff lives. Now, the winner of today's series will promote to the next week's matches where things kick off with Team Liquid versus Golden Guardians and Cloud9 facing FlyQuest shortly after. Of course, whoever does unfortunately lose this series will be our second team eliminated from the postseason. So both, uh, both teams here really needing to pick up three wins on this day. Now, as the action heats up on the Rift, we enter the second most prestigious competition on this program. That is, of course, Jeopardash Playoff Editions. Uh, Crumbs, welcome to the lineup. We resurrected you from the dead, I believe. No, no, not from the dead, Dash. I was just waiting for the most important segment of there the show. There it is. Oh, like a typical Hufflepuff, show, <laughs> typical Hufflepuff <laughs> showing up late. <laughs> Such a classic. All right, get ready for question number one. The LCS has had 80 
8-0 best of five playoff series in its history. On average, how many games does the series go? Hint, the answer is either three, four, or five. So uh, you're asking how many times do we get silver scrapes? No, I'm asking on average how many games does the series go? And we're we're oh. rounding, right? Because an average, this is like a median average. Uh, yes. Because yeah, I would yeah. like some more specific terminology, <laughs> mean, median, or mode yeah. here, James. I can't figure this out. It can't be mean. That's okay. like 3.4 or something. I'm ready to guess. All right. Go, Crubs. 4.2. 4.2. Okay. He gave me a decimal even though we said we would round. Uh, I, I'll actually right. say <laughs> the most frequent one is a five-game series. Really? But sure. but most frequent and average is different. well. Are, is, that's why I don't understand. If it's if it's <laughs> median, it's it's technically like it's which the, so you're slashing the average. Three. If it's four point two, the average would be four, right? Because we'd round yeah. down. I'm gonna say four because I don't understand the math. Yeah, it, ha- it has question. to be four. Yeah, all right. <laughs> has to be four. It has to be the average. All right, so all four of them are locking in on four. Boom! You are correct. The average nice. number of games per best of five is four. I have a lot of follow-up questions. I mean, you this, can't guess three derail. or five, though, because those are the two ends of the spectrum that they right, can Right, they'll be. get chopped first. All right, yeah, Mark. they'll get chopped All right, Mark, first. what's the mean? Well, that's why I, don't, that's why I have a bunch it's of follow-up questions. It's also four. The average and the mean are both four. All right, moving on to question number two. Playoffs are where legends are made, or they're banned away. What is the most banned champion during playoffs in LCS all time? Oh. Ooh, most banned. Okay. What's most always banned broken? champion all time. Oh, I, I got it. I got it. I, I got, got one. one. LeBlanc. Okay, go ahead, guys. <laughs> we got I'm gonna LeBlanc. S- a LeBlanc call out LeBlanc of crumbs. I'm, I'm actually going to say Aatrox. I think he's been in the meta for like two years straight now. Okay, and you think he's always been in dominant form when playoffs has rolled around? I think so. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say Syndra. I like the idea of a strong mid laner that's been around forever. Syndra Syndra sounds like that. To okay, me. two votes for mid lane, one for a top laner. Although Wait, can I put another vote? If it's Callista, I'm going to be really all mad. over the map. Uh, all right, there. The votes are locked in. Let's get the reveal. Gangplay. Gangplay. Oh wow. Okay, he was Nine. obnoxious Nine. for Wait. a while. Yeah. He Our was stats quite just said LeBlanc is the most banned champion all time LCS. But not playoffs. So yeah. Yeah, it was a playoffs. good guess, LeBlanc, uh, Crumbs. But GP got really broken right at uh, season five's playoffs with like the juggernaut patch or whatever all that stuff was and his like little event that was he couldn't even practice him because <laughs> they killed him yeah. off in game. Remember that? <laughs> they killed him. Yep. <laughs> I think that's the reason he got so many bans. Everyone's like, I haven't been able to play him in solo queue. I don't know what I'm doing. Yep. All right, you guys ready for this last one? Last one's quite a bit tougher. Yeah. Quite a bit tougher. All right, there are four champions that have a 100% win rate during playoffs in LCS all time. Give me one of the four. I feel like this is so troll. Yeah, there's going to be one many champ games. That, yeah, that's what I picked it you once. You would have to assume that most of them have yeah. not been played a ton of times if they have a 100% win yeah, It has to be a rare win. <sighs> but you have to, so you have to give me one of four. There are four champions that would be the correct answer here. Soraka. Thi- okay, Soraka's an interesting guess. She's not super like she wouldn't be spammed a ton, but whenever she's played, it's usually because she's hella broken. So I mm-hmm. think she could have a hundred percent. There's a there's a line of logic that would really help you guys out here. And if I you mean, can find okay, your way to can it, can you say it? Uh, no, I'll give you the hint. If you guys if you guys don't no, all no guess hints. it, I'll give you a hint. I won't. No, I'm hint. saying give a give. Okay, Mark yeah, already right, made so, his guess, Soraka. That's right. right I'm I'm gonna guess that. like Viger because I know like a few teams were playing it as a counter into his ear okay. only. He was never blind pick, so. I like that. I like that guess. Unfortunately, and it was also a C nine pick when they were winning. Unfortunately, that's incorrect. Crumbs, what are you thinking? Mm. I was also thinking mid laners. I was thinking things like Zillion, Cassidy, but I don't remember how many times Zillion has been played in playoffs and actually quite a few won all of them. because yeah. maybe he has before. taken some loss. It is. It is not Zillion. Now the line of logic, the hint that I will give you: think players who have one trick champions. Riven. Riven. <laughs> Not quite. Okay, good. Oh. Well, nice guess, but actually Riven is a no. Think other other players throughout LCS history that have, like, you know, very significant champions that if played would have high win rates but would probably only get played once or twice. There's a few. Can you give us a hint? Can we give us <laughs> another, another like, hint? Can you now give away the champions? But here, I'll give you the player and you'll get the champion. Froggen. Anivia. Oh, Anivia. Anivia. Boom. One game, 100% win rate. Who he? 
Aurelian Soul. Aurelian Soul. Oh two games. God. Two games. Two Not wins. Not really dumb. All right, let's Impact. keep doing this. Impact. Uh, singed. singed. Oh wait, it they singed. put it on screen. There they go. They pop. Production. Up, but we, I like the layups. <laughs> I like getting the freebies. You like by the layups? You're just yeah. dunking them, alley ooping them all. Okay, well done. Three points. Mortifier uh, has 100% win rate in playoffs. Uh, oh yeah, this playoffs at least. Yep. it hasn't lost. He must as have of, never as of as of yesterday. It had never been played before. And I was going to say it must have never been played. Yep, it was three, and then we changed this Jeopardy ass question as a result of yesterday's game. Uh, we were going to do three champions. Now it is four. All right, well done, gents. But see, yeah, that line of logic: players who have like a signature champion would definitely okay. have high win rates. Uh, with that, we're going to step away. But as we go, Evil Geniuses are expanding their reach with Hooney opening a new rideshare program. But not everyone's invited, so let's take a look. Hey, need a ride, bro? Yeah. Hey! Oh, I'm sorry. I was confused. I don't know which one was the gas. Yeah, yeah, my bad, my bad. Okay. Oh, I don't know what my car is doing. A bad car. It was not me. I think the car is, I think it's kind of broken. I don't know what's happening. From the back first, probably? Time to rest up, man. Okay. Get some behind. <sighs> You got it. Time to rest up. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the LCS Countdown. We're just minutes away from our next playoff series, 100 Thieves versus Evil Geniuses. Now, ahead of their playoff qualifications, tensions were rising for the seventh place squad as we look at the latest episode of their docuseries, The Heist. It's kind of OP for the losing bracket. Low key. And nice. we need four best of five. Hey, but hey, hey, if we win four, we're in Worlds. Only Chris Cole does. If we win four, we're in Worlds. Yeah. Just imagine we serve for three. Yeah. Right? And we just 15 0. It's the same thing. I mean, it sounds easy. Five best of five, that's a normal practice week. We can still win the whole thing. Cody, we can still win Worlds. In fact, if we win eight BO5s in a row, we've won Worlds. I play every season believing that I have a chance, at least, to get first place in my league and lift the LCS trophy and go to an, an international event. For this playoffs, it's really no different for me. Regardless of the seeding, you know, if you want to take first place in the region, then you have to beat out every team anyways. And with the way the system works right now, being in the loser's bracket with only one best of five to live off of is what I'm used to from previous playoffs. It definitely won't be easy, but like it never comes easily. I really think it's just it's just gonna come down to uh, whoever shows up during, the, during that day because like I've won best of fives being down zero two. I've won best of fives one and two or whatever the case is. Just gonna use everything that I learned from my previous years playing in the LCS as well as Challenger and just try my best to perform in the moment. It's so dangerous about us is that we're just we just play without any fear of anything and. This year is definitely a crazy year for me and for our team, so you know, I'm really down for a crazy playoffs. Make sure you catch the entire episode of The Heist on the 100 Thieves YouTube channel. Now, both of these squads will need someone to step up if they want to keep their hopes at a title match alive. And for 100 Thieves, a lot of eyes are going to be on their explosive jungler in Contracts. And if you remember Contracts' career, he started off as being one of the hottest amateur junglers. Everybody wanted to get their hands on him, so he joins Cloud9, the talent development machine, and it doesn't work out. He ended up going to Golden Guardians afterwards, and it did not look good. It was a rough split, so then he gets demoted into a Academy and climbs his way through until this year finally gets a shot to take over Medius' pot and it really shows that he's a very aggressive jungler. The same kind of aggression that we see from him at the very beginning of his career, he still has it here, whether it's on champions like Olaf with the rest of the team backing him up or showing us the first win on NA in Italy in the LCS. So this team really performs best when they can give him a ton of resources and put the rest of the team in more of a supportive role like Ryoma on the Gallia. First win on Nidalee, the first team to take down Cloud9 when they were undefeated. I love the callback to the fact that he was on Cloud9. Uh, you know, contracts to me so much uh, reminds me of what Blabber is now, you know, uh, but of three years ago, Mark.
Yeah, he had success at Worlds, if, if people don't remember. You know, they, they, he looked great on the world stage. Everyone thought he was going to be, like you were saying, the new hotness in North America. And then the the getting removed, getting put onto Golden Gardens through, uh, you know, and then struggling with that lineup was such a shock to a lot of people. And it's great to see him back on the LCS stage dominating games again. And he'll need to do that today if they have any hope of actually upsetting EG here. Right, let's talk about his opponent. Today he's up against Sven Skarin, a former MVP who has himself struggled this split. You can see there's statistically nothing overwhelmingly in his favor. Yeah, I mean, Sven Skarin, we always kind of joked, like his stats look like crap, but, you know, just watch him in the game and the eye test kind of tells you a different story he's a lot more involved but i would have to say this last series that eg played is kind of uninspired i'm very lukewarm on svenskaren right now he did have a little bit of a lead against santorin but he wasn't really that involved in the lanes and when he plays against contracts his job is going to be contain contracts in Ryoma so their top lane is okay so i really hope eg gives him more agency maybe gives him a counter pick I don't want to really see that, you know, Sejuani into Graves again, where he has, like, nowhere to go and doesn't play the game for 20 minutes. I'm glad you brought up the last time these teams faced, because just one week ago, it was EG against 100 Thieves, and 100 Thieves slapped EG. It was not close. It was a stomp. So it's only a week that EG had to now play another best of five and is now facing off against 100 Thieves, who already showed that in the jungle matchup, when it was Graves for Sven Skarin and Nidalee for Contracts, Contracts prevailed. Well, so, so far talking about where 100 Thieves might find an advantage, I want to now flip to the other side and talk about where EG might find one of their own. As Sven Skarin has seemed to have maybe a dip in performance, it appears that there is more reliance from Evil Geniuses on Golden Glue in the mid lane. Yeah, I mean, the stats aren't super impressive because it was a full five-game series that they ended up losing. But I think the thing that I would call attention to is in their wins, who was winning them these games? And it was almost always Golden Glue. The flash forward on the Orianna ball to find Turtle to set them up for that team fight. Then the game four, when they had the LeBlanc Shen, you know, it was him popping off and winning in them those games. And I think this is a different look than I think a lot of people were expecting when you hear Hooney and Golden Glue coming in. They're bringing in Golden Glue for stability and whatnot. But at some point, you got to adapt to your plan and realize Golden Glue is probably your best early and mid-game threat right now, most consistent for sure, and play right. around him a little bit more in terms of picks and uh, with Sven Skarin. I mean, let's just be super real, probably. When you think LeBlanc and you think Evil Geniuses, most people are still going to think Jizuke and not Golden Glue. But it was Golden Glue that they had success with when paired with that Shen looking to combo and make plays. Yeah, I mean, so the series start was kind of confusing because, yeah, they're doing this, like, Hecarim top dive thing. And at first I was like, all right, they have some adaptation, right? They do a 4-1 with Nar, and then, you know, Golden Glue gets the Orianna pick that kind of enables them to go into the game four. Then game four, they do the, you know, Shin LeBlanc. Again, Golden Glue is the star. Then in game five, they have no agency anywhere. They're just all farming for 20 minutes, and they first start make a play. I think, like, 22 minutes was the first time they made a play that game. So it's like their, their lo drafts and losses look really bad. Like, they're not really that coherent, and they kind of, like, don't seem like they're reacting well to their opponents. But then in their wins, they have, like, these nice comps where Golden Glue is the star. So I can't really tell what they want to do. Well, it's something that was happening to the lineup before Golden Glue and Huni even showed up. When Jazuke and Kuma were playing, we often yeah. realized that the draft that was a big problem for the team, whether it was not fitting to the play styles of the current players or even just maybe too experimental and not allowing the old style that we saw their success in spring sh come to light in summer. And I think against Ryoma, they'll have the opportunity to play around mid a little bit more. I think, uh, you know, PoE was obviously an all-pro uh, mid laner, very difficult to, to get wins against. But Ryoma has good games, but he also has bad games. He's very inconsistent. You remember back in spring playoffs, he actually went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bjergsen in that series and looked great. But then he also has games where he has a really hard time and keeps getting killed over and over. So it's a bit of a question of which Ryoma is going to show up. But I think he's more exploitable than, say, the FlyQuest series was with PoE. Probably you mentioned some of the draft experimentation that EG was doing uh, in uh, yesterday or the series before, rather, the day before. Oh, my God. Time, time is melting yeah. together, gents. Four days straight of best of five. It's that, uh, <laughs> that hot outside. Time <laughs> when did they, when did they last The heat get into you. Uh, but you mentioned the experimentation they were doing with their drafts, like bringing yeah. the Hecarim to the top lane for Huni, and that, to me, just uh, brings my attention to the top lane where it has to be acknowledged someday on the other side of the rift. So is that the kind of experimentation you would want EG to continue to do in the face of someone like Sunday, or go with more known quantities since Sunday is, is really, truly a threat? I mean, I don't know. Whenever I want EG to do something, they don't do it. I thought playing around <laughs> bot lane was a really great idea. It brought them success in the spring. 
But I think this is probably going to be the most pivotal matchup of the series. Someday is the playmaker for 100 Thieves. If you shut down Someday, you have a really good chance of winning the game. And then, so this might be where they pull out more unconventional picks because Someday is a very uh, logical player. He's going to get a small advantage and grow it slowly. He's not going to take these gigantic risks all the time. So if they do want to throw some kind of experimental pick in the top lane, I think it might have some relevancy against Someday because he's, you know, he's not going to know what small advantages he can get. And I think that might be the best way to, you know, kind of confuse 100 Thieves' best player. I would still be scared to do that. I mean, if you're doing these weird experimental carry picks, like, it's just as likely that Huni kind of throws the lead as well with those kind of champions. Oh, oh yeah. uh, so if you go top carry versus carry, that becomes a bit of a black hole where both teams are going to send more attention to the top lane. And I think Contracts and Someday have been playing well together, better than Sven and Huni. So I would be scared about making it a top 2v2, top 3v3 kind of situation. And that's why I think indexing more towards Golden Glue makes extra sense in this matchup uh, because you're avoiding, hopefully, playing into the enemy team's best player. Shen will always be relevant for Huni. Conversation around the top lane uh, meta is very interesting. Uh, I think similarly, the conversation around the bot lane meta is interesting when you're looking at 80 carries specifically in this matchup because it's been brought up before. I'll bring it up again. Bang, his champion pool doesn't seem the best suited for the way that the meta itself has been driven here in the postseason. Yep. Some Dev Caitlin. definitely missing from that is the number of these games. He has like seven on Aphelio, six on Ezreal, and then a massive drop off to I think two or three on Senna, and that's including you know yesterday's games. He does actually. Seem it's actually eight on Aphelios, seven on Ezreal, four on Senna, and then two one one for those last. Right. So he does not seem to play the the current meta, which is Ash Aphelio. Oh, excuse me, Ash uh, Caitlyn, and he does play the Senna, but. That feels a little limited if, if you aren't able to play that and you're having to spend bans to push uh, both people down the ladder a little bit to where Bang's champion pool is again good. Questions to be answered in just a few minutes. Now, how did their playoff match and quest for a world's qualification? We heard from 100 Thieves general manager Papa Smithy about their postseason goals. So happy to get some words from Papa Smithy ahead of this 100 Thieves EG match. First things first, I want to get your perspective on this when it comes to playoffs, because on the one hand, you have a player in Cody Sun that's never missed Worlds, an all-pro top laner in Someday, but on the other, you have Poom turned pro in seven months, you have the recent return of contracts, very ends of the spectrum, so how does this kind of inform your expectations for this playoff run? I think expectations has been a word that has been consistently reevaluated all year at 100 Thieves. And so we came into summer rolling back our roster and started one and five and had to reevaluate. And from there, the pieces that we brought in, you know, are kind of traditionally thought of, like you say, with specifically Poom as pieces that we know is, are going to get there in the future. Like we've been so excited about Poom's performance so far, but we're also so excited about where he can go, what he can become. What I can say is the roster is six and six. The practice has been good. And all we can do is to orient ourselves on our opponent, on evil geniuses, and do our best to win on the weekend. You talk about the impact that bringing in someone like Purim has had on this roster, and it feels like ever since those changes, people are looking for ways to describe 100 Thieves. And in an episode of The Heist, you actually said that while some may describe them as a coin flip team, you would actually call them a volatile team. Mm -hmm. Care to elaborate upon that and how that plays into the best of five experience? The, the process doesn't always explain the result. It's kind of like a Baron flip happens, they get the win, and it's like, oh, that's typical this team. You know what I mean? But our team, the one thing I can say is the quality of our wins, like when we win, it's usually like very dominant. You know, the Evil Geniuses win was 23 minutes, short, uh, shortest game of the season. But I think we passed the eye test in a really good way. And I think when things don't go to plan, it can also be a pretty crushing defeat. You look at the weekend, you're like, all right, now I think that's not going to be something that catches us off guard. But on the other end, you know, the season also goes by quick. And now we're having what is going to basically be final assessment after final assessment. And we don't have any more slack to have a major breakthrough. Like we have to perform now. And that's kind of the, that's the trepidation I have is I get to watch on, I get to make sense of what's happening in practice. And then if we, if we play to it, then I have utmost confidence of what we can achieve.
When you talk about not having that slack right now and you look to the team to be on the same page, and I think one of the things impressive with 100 Thieves is you are all on the same page of where that improvement needs to come. One of those areas seems to be when 100 Thieves isn't ahead, communication being improved and having some certainty. In this playoff scenario, being that it is here and now, mm -hmm. are you looking to a certain player to uptake on that or has it been a collective between everyone to try and keep that energy high in those lower moments? we have people that step up and it's not always who you would expect. Like our what's next person is, is, is Poom, right? And he's the, the rookie in the equation. The sage words, that's often from some days, so that's a little bit more expected, right? When it comes to experience, but for sure it's everyone pitching in and for sure it's been a growing process. But when it comes to those fundamentals of the game, the fundamentals of team play, I'm really, really confident in where we are on those things. And considering those fundamentals and how they worked so well last time you faced off against EG, but they did bring the last series against FlyQuest all the way to five games. What are your thoughts on this upcoming matchup? Where to take away things is going to be so tricky. You know, we watched on EG play a really tough five game series. We're definitely coming in refreshed. We're definitely coming in with our own expectations. So I'm super confident about what we can achieve, but I'm going to be biting my nails and nervous on the day, I think, like most people are. First time we're getting to see 100 Thieves here in the playoffs. We'll all be biting our nails. Pop Smithy, thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. And with that, let's send things back over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you very much, the Tigress. Thank you, Papa Smithy. I, I, I love the uh, honesty in saying while he's confident, he will very much be sitting there biting his nails uh, yeah. in anticipation as the uh, the matches get underway uh, with the match just minutes away. Let's get some predictions up on the screen. We have had some differences. We've already had some upsets by the numbers in this postseason bracket. And Crumbs is once again right. calling it differently than okay. the other two on the desk. So Crumbs the coming to you first. Well, first Why does yeah, it, it, it's very easy for these guys. You just predict higher seed. Yes, makes sense. But right. the one that really strikes me as 100 Thieves having a good chance here is that they beat EG in an obliterating fashion just a week ago, right? Like just one week ago, this was not close. I think Svenskeren ended 0-6 or something in that game. They actually got to play the composition that we saw them go against C9. I think they have worked more on that. And despite EG going a close game, a close series against FlyQuest, they have still not shown that they can contest against somebody that presses them early like 100 Thieves will. Mark, you seem unconvinced. I, I would have gone 100 Thieves without that series uh, earlier this week. I thought the way they played FlyQuest was pretty good. And 100 Thieves has only shown a couple small comps that they can really execute on. And a best of five, I think that will start to bite them in the butt a little bit. All right, there you go. Oh, we got some cat appearances right oh. at the end. They wanted to make sure they got Ooh. their camera time before we toss it over to the cast. It's Raven Kobe to get us into game one. 